Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our podcast, Raya Affairs. Before getting into some announcements, I just wanted to introduce myself as your host for today. My name is Marina, and I am the Project Development Coordinator at Raya, and I've been hosting Raya Affairs for a while now. And today, I'm really thrilled to say that we are here for the fifth and final episode of our series, Climate Leaders 101. In this five-episode series, of which we began last year, we will be analyzing the stakes, policies, and personalities of climate leaders from around the world, with individuals ranging from Brazil to Kenya to Spain and many more. As per usual, I'll give you the brief overview of RIA as an organization. It is an international think tank led by professionals that translates the abstract world of international affairs by simplifying rather than generalizing. RIA is where you can come to learn about the stories and worries of political leaders, the behind the scenes of their decision making, and how politics impacts and changes your life. So this is Raya Affairs, filling you in wherever you are. We would also like to make it clear that any expressed opinions in this episode are welcome, even though they're not a direct reflection of Raya, as Raya specializes in unbiased writing and analysis. So over the next following weeks, we have dedicated our episodes to climate leaders in the collaboration between Raya, IE University, and the IE School of Politics, Economics, and Global Affairs. So over the summer, 10 IE students underwent weeks of Raya training, familiarizing themselves with the Raya methodology that really places the individual decision maker at the center of the analysis. And those same students also attended other research related seminars held by Raya, featuring alumni working in the EU climate policy at the EU Commission, working with climate migration and an external youth climate activist. So given all of this, they each prepared their climate leader reports, which will be published once a week on the Raya website. So regarding this episode, this week we'll be moving on from the Brazilian president and climate leader Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva, or Lula, and shifting the conversation towards our final profile. We will be discussing Teresa Rivera, Spain's Minister for the Ecological Transition and the Demographic Challenge since 2018. With that in mind, let's kick it off. I would like to introduce Ajinka Despande, the summer program intern who will tell us about his findings. And he wrote this report together with Valeria Eggers, who will not be joining us today. All right, so hi, Ajinka, and welcome to Raya Affairs. Let's begin with an introduction about yourself. So where are you from? What do you do? And why were you interested in joining the Raya summer program? Uh, hello, um, thank you so much for having me on this uh, podcast recording. And I'm very honored to uh, have this conversation about uh, Teresa Rivera. And I'm studying at IE University based in the Segovia campus. And I study Bachelors of International Relations at the Segovia campus. And I was um, interested for joining Raya actually since quite a long time, you know, because I, I was looking for good summer program opportunities for the summer and you know it uh, raya was something that was recommended to uh, me twice so i thought maybe i should take a look at that and also uh, what raya offered good was a good research methodology and that's what i wanted to sharpen myself in i wanted to be more proficient in the research methodologies for you know research in ir as well as you know uh, opening up new avenues to study about climate actors, you know, especially climate advocacy that we learn a lot about. So the inner happenings inside what happens in the fight against climate change, so to speak. So that's what I wanted to know more about. Uh, so here I am because of um, the combination of, you know, what Raya has to offer. So thanks. Excellent. Excellent. Perfect. So now this next question is one that I really ask all the guests on the podcast because everyone is passionate about IR. We know that, but also because the answers are, are always so different from each other. So Ajinka, what leader, dead or alive, who has impacted the world, would you like the opportunity to have a conversation with if you could? 
I'd say Dag Hammarskjöld. I don't know if you know him, but uh, he was the former Secretary General of the United Nations. And I always, always, I, practically his, um, I f- see my reflection in, in Dag Hammarskjöld. I know I, I, I shouldn't be saying this on such a personal level because it's like Dag Hammarskjöld was uh, someone who had different set of, um, you know, uh, uh, actions, beliefs, and moral systems, but the way he went about doing things in reforming the United Nations, you know, especially when he created his own staff, like he had this his own secretariat, and back then it was a very revolutionary move because he was committed to being politically independent. Like he had a, a proficiency in politics. It was it was. It was very, very easy for him to conduct negotiations and everything. But he all never took a side. Like, he was always dedicated to the uh, what he labeled as the better cause for something that would preserve peace and would prevent conflict among nations. And I, I took a look at some of his actions about Israel and Egypt, uh, about uh, the decolonization of Africa and everything. But he, he might have had his flaws, but... The things that he did in, in, you know, as an attempt to restore order in that place, that was something that's very admirable. So I really, really love Doug Hammarskjöld's efforts and I really love the way he conducted his administration and the way he managed people under, uh, working under him. He always like went with them, ate with them in the cafeteria and stuff. So yeah, that, that shows good signs of a leader. So Doug Hammarskjöld definitely would have love to have a big conversation with him. <laughs> yeah, perfect. It's actually interesting. I think it's the first time that someone has uh, appointed a leader f- coming from the United Nations. People usually always answer someone, a great historical figure or someone like important from today. So it's great to know, get to know you more as our guest in this episode. But let's now begin with our actual leader and have an introduction of Teresa Rivera. So she has been in ministerial positions for the Spanish government since 2008. But Ajinka, could you tell us more about her background and what got her into politics in the first place? So um, for Teresa Rivera, um, her early life is not so known. Like it it is something that she hasn't talked about much, even though she has mentioned uh, quite a few stuff about her early life as a child, but uh, how that led into her political career is something that is not very well known. I would say it's in the shadows. But still, to do justice to the question, I have a few uh, ideas that we analyzed in our work uh, that led to Teresa Rivera being where she is today. I would say first and foremost, um, Teresa Rivera was... Uh, spending a lot of time in the countryside when she was uh, young. And spending time in the countryside exposed her childhood directly to the environment, to nature and everything. But apart from the factor that of her childhood, she also had her uh, relatives, especially her grandparents, uh, who, you know, had introduced her, or talked to her about all these things, you know about uh, climate and everything. And apart from that, her career in academia before politics is the most important factor of where Teresa Rivera has reached today. Like if it were not all that exposure she got in academia, especially her time in in Paris, uh, it would not have been possible for Teresa Rivera to be so informed about what she is today. So, you know, I would elaborate it further, but I think that her time in the academia sector was something that that got her into politics in the first place because she's one of the climate leaders. I remember discussing with my partner that Teresa Rivera was one of the uh, climate leaders that had a genuine interest in, in uh, climate action. And most of the presidents or heads of state that we label as climate leaders do it for their own interest or greenwashing per se for such controversial reasons. But Teresa Rivera, she she has 
uh, been consistent in climate action since the beginning. And I think her early life in academia was something that contributed to the same. Yeah, thank you. All right, perfect. So would you say that you're able to, based on your research, draw a comparison to Teresa's time uh, in each of these po political positions? So could you draw a comparison to her time as the Spanish Secretary of State for Climate Change and now the current position that she holds What does your research really show about her leadership style in each of these experiences? Oh, wow, well, well, very, very interesting question. Um, you know, Teresa Rivera's time in the government first time was far different in leadership as compared to her time in the government now. You know, uh, her post-academia uh, phase in the government was something where she focused on fixing errors per se, you know. She focused on raising awareness on climate action, on climate change, you know, when she was uh, Secretary of State. I took a look at some of the actions that were taken from 2008-2011 and uh, her some of her early time as, uh, you know, when she was the Secretary of State. I looked at a pattern where I saw that she was only coinciding with, you know, how other ministers used to do, like fixing errors, fixing particular errors and uh, talking about uh, the Paris Agreement and, you know, um, but then the action changes later. If I were to explain a bit in uh, simple words, she has taken a preventive approach, you know, and she has, she has taken all sections of the society, businesses, industries, government officials um, as, and even if possible uh, the lower sections of the society that were uh, in opposition to her actions like the farmers very important those were carried on board at least she tried and that's what her differences in leadership was in one end she was fixing stuff that was already bad and the other one she was trying to frame something new that will serve her um, policies on climate action very very specifically that is yeah taking into consideration some of her policies yeah thank you thank you all right so thank you for your answers so i actually read your entire report and i found it very interesting that you mentioned that teresa's pivotal moment as per se or as a climate leader was not actually in her time in Spain, but as the director of the IDDRI, which is also known for those of us that don't know as the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations. So what exactly is the IDDRI and what was Teresa in charge of during her role as the director? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is also a pretty important question in Teresa Rivera's uh, career, her defining moment in the IDDRI. Um, I would say, starting off with what the IDDRI is, it's a, you know, Parisian-based think tank, I would say. And uh, it is something that she served as a director in. And the IDDRI itself has been highly recognized for its contribution to the Paris Agreement when uh, Teresa Ribera was in the leadership of the uh, IDDRI. And it, it's, it's said that IDDRI's ambition uh, for international cooperation and transformation is something that was a, something that was given by Teresa Ribera to <laughs> IDDRI. I know it's something that's very informal of me to say, but Teresa Ribera's time in the IDDRI was marked with a lot of connections she made a, met a lot of important people she made uh, like uh, she had conversations with people from all sectors she met politicians she met activists most importantly she met people who had an expertise in climate related biodiversity related uh, agendas so that's where she got a clear image of her environmental policies Because she was responsible for uh, that when she became the Secretary of State after that. So, sorry, before that, I would say. So, sorry. You know, so that's where she got her insight. 
And lastly, one very small point that I would like to mention that she developed a new perspective when she was in the IDDRI because she learned how to develop plans for certain strategies, you know, regarding a, a diversity about droughts and everything and the potential transition uh, uh, that was later in the spotlight. Yes. Yeah, so you actually got ahead of us there, Will, because I'll ask you a question exactly about this transition back to Spain. But yeah, I know you mentioned connections. As a follow-up, when we think about her contributions during her time at the IDDRI, would you say that Teresa was no longer limited to the national climate arena, so just Spanish policies, but to the regional arena? So in the European policy dimension, how did she contribute? And you can use examples. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'll, I'll be using a very relevant example for this answer. Uh, I remember the uh, Fit for 55 program of the European Union. So I'd say Teresa Rivera's contributions and attempts to, you know, um, for, to strengthen her sphere of action, you know, was in line with the European Union. And I would say that, uh, you know, with regards to the her policy outlook, I'm going a bit into the policy outlook. Teresa Rivera had a lot of credibility, especially in the 2014 to 18, those four years. And, um, you know, after this, uh, the IDDRI years, but uh, after that, when Teresa Rivera started you know, bringing into consideration the uh, the societal aspects and the private sector, international policy experts and everything. That's when we see the European Union coming into coming into place. You know, where the European Union had these expectations, which Teresa Rivera was very very much in line to fulfill, because it was like a mutual beneficial beneficiary, uh, informal relationship between the both. So, you know, there's the Integrated National Cl Energy and Climate Plan, one of the most important parts of her career also, you know, which talks about 32% reduction in greenhouse gases emissions by 2030, as well as, you know, improvements in energy efficiency. So those are the stuff that she developed, you know, as a plan in line with what she uh, wants to project to the European Union. Teresa Rivera wants Spain's position in the European Union to be like a, of a model country within the climate action sector. So I think that that's what's driving her to do all this stuff, you know. So that's one of the points I would like to mention is as very important. Yeah. So thank you, Ajinka. And I think we'll talk about the why in just a second, but to wrap up this discussion of Teresa's time at the think tank, what would you say were some lessons learned um, and how did she apply these lessons back to her role uh, in of being in charge of the ecological transition of Spain? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the lessons learned were basically to um, integrate in efficient policies from, you know, uh, from what she learned, that was one of the lessons learned that she was able to incorporate the efficiency of past leaders or what they wanted to do. And she actually materialized those things. That was one of the lessons learned. Second lessons learned is to have a good consolidation of positive relationships within the appropriate sector. In her case, it was the climate sector. And another lesson that she applied in the transition period was that to go along with all sections of the society, by far the hardest thing that she has been trying to do, and I admit that she hasn't been able to do so the whole thing. But yeah, that's one of the lessons. And the th another last lesson that I would like to emphasize here, this is also for uh, very appropriate for the audience, is that academia is a very impactful sector. We underestimate academia, but in um, states of, you know, in Europe or anywhere else across the world where academia is gaining relevance nowadays, it's very, very important, even in politics. And Teresa Ribera showed how under her leadership, the think tank 
very much got involved in the Paris Agreement and it was her own personal projection for the same and you know she it actually made her reach the peak point of her academic career so yeah that's that's those are the lessons learned all right uh, so thank you for those lessons learned very well put so our listeners can really take away that Teresa was responsible for shifting how climate action came to be in Spain largely influenced by her time at the IDDRI Regarding the why she is so concerned, and you mentioned a little bit about her motivations for her policies, Ajinka, would you say that her main motivations also stem from the issues that Spain is facing? If so, briefly, what would you say are the main climate-related issues in Spain? Oh, well, yes, I agree to you for to a certain extent. I think that her actions were derived out of solving these climate related issues and her motivations somewhere down the line came from all these issues that affected Spain as a whole so I think that I would be um, I'll be briefing on certain important climate related issues that Spain is facing and how it ties into the political sphere it's very important to see how Uh, it's also affecting Spanish society on a daily basis. So I think that first and foremost is the is the drought issue, right? Like there was, we have many regions of the earth being affected by various disasters. Uh, I won't say that Spain was so, you know, uh, badly affected. But the Spain has a very, very big issue. And that issue is that of a drought. Because... Drought is something that is causing the staple crops and everything to be affected, you know. And the prices are also affected at the end of the day. The prices of these staples. And tying into this point, there is another point of energy poverty. You know, there is a steep rise in energy prices, especially in Spain. And there is so much of an uncertainty of LNG supply. And in this regard... Spain wants to shift to a more renewable and alternative energy sources. So what do you expect to happen? Like there will be a phase where the country has to suffer or suffer the effects of this, you know, after effects of these, um, you know, the rising prices and everything. So that's one of the challenges of Spain and it's burdening Spain very much. And while Spain has one of the highest levels of natural gas in Europe, Spain produces less than 0.5% of the gas that it consumes. That's the funny thing. So, you know, there is also... We also remember the figure by Eurostat that was uh, analyzing the impact of energy poverty on the Spanish citizens. It said that 10.9% of the Spanish citizens were not able to keep their homes warm in 2020. That's, that's, That's something that touched me personally because... Those issues are something that you could see in other parts of the world also. And also previously, I said about um, the Fit for 55 program, right? And there were the, uh, uh, that ties into here also because there are a set of regulations that aim to revise certain policies and legislations, such as EU emissions trading system and also about aviation emissions. So Spain is also working on that simultaneously to deal with those kind of, those kind of emissions. You know, and lastly speaking, another big issue that Spain is facing about uh, climate action is lack of action from the political parties. There is a central politics versus local politics in uh, issue in Spain, you know, Spanish politics 101. You know, it's like where uh, regional parties and uh, regional governments are not in line with the central government and their actions clash with that of the central government. And that's why, you know, about healthcare and uh, about those crops and everything, those actions to counter climate change or the effects of that on the farms never get implemented. And even though there are organizations like Greenpeace who are praising Teresa Rivera, but repetitive droughts are something that even Teresa is finding it hard to deal with. There's rice, cereals, olives. Their prices are also being affected because of this. 
areas are running dry and soil moisture is recovering but it's not as sufficient as we would expect it to be you know my favorite area in spain it's called asturias you know it's one of the regions that is most affected by the drought it's very sad so that's one of the is that some of the issues that are driving her motivation all right thank you and i think it was very interesting in your report how you explained exactly this decentralization of climate action policies because uh, Spain has these autonomous regions. But thank you, Ajinka, for your very in-depth answers. Let's go on to the policy outlook. What would you say is Teresa's most innovative climate action policy, the one that you were most interested in researching, and what does your research show uh, regarding this policy? All right, so I'm going to say that the most impactful policy that Teresa Ribera is on the path of implementing those, is, you know, I'm saying on the path of implementing because it's something that has not been very well implemented as of now, but it's so well framed that even though it's being implemented to a certain extent, it's implemented very well, I think. And I would stick to that. And it's called the uh, Integrated National Energy and Climate Plan. I had mentioned that previously, right? I think that that's one of the most important uh, policies of her career. It sets out climate and energy objectives. Like, you know, uh, they have given a certain baseline. Uh, these are the amount of emissions that were there in 1990. And we have to control the emissions to so and so level until the 2030, you know, and that varies from uh, the type of emissions we're talking about because it focuses on decarbonization and it talks about increasing shares of renewable sources in the Spanish electricity sector, relatively untouched in many of the analysis that happens in um, Spanish politics. So electricity sector, very important. And as such, you know, um, Spanish society is very uh, cooperative in certain parts, but not so cooperative in other parts. So I think it has um, that has caused something that is causing a roadblock, a small roadblock that I think in this policy, because it needs coordination for its implementation, which Teresa is trying hard to do so. But, you know, uh, politics ties in everywhere and there is bureaucratic challenges that she's facing. You know, and this action, uh, what I'm talking about, uh, this plan is also tying into the Spanish urban agenda and, you know, integrating it with the uh, hydrogen roadmap to remove, you know, uh, bureaucratic obstacles and to make a radical shift to more green energy sources. As the only thing is that she needs to take into consideration the interests of regional parties, such as Partido Popular, the PP, one of the main opposition that is contesting uh, her party in the election and they are I'm not lying they're they're seeming to have a very good ground and yes so I think that that's a very good policy that has impacted her all right so you mentioned that you know Teresa is on the path of implementing this plan does your research then show any impact assessments uh, of this policy what has been the impact so far of her integrated plan? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, I would say that the integrated national climate and energy plan, it had, it has had quite a few ups and downs. We actually have a graph in our research, which very well shows this, uh, this phenomenon. But I think my impact assessment of this plan would be that it's, too, um, it is too far-fetched yeah, and its impact has been um, limited but concentrated in a very good amount of uh, sectors that Teresa wants to touch upon. You know, I'll give an example. There is uh, also, there is also a plan about creating jobs like, you know, um, the projection to create like uh, 522,000 jobs, if I'm not wrong, by 2030. That's one of the best impacts, I would say, that I've had uh, with this policy because 
it has reached various economic sectors. I'll tell you, it's not just energy industry, but even construction sectors. You know, it's something that has reached even that sector. So it has planned to create certain jobs. And, you know, I, I'm living in Spain. And I, when I see people, it's, it's a personal anecdote. When uh, it's, you know, homelessness and unemployment is something that one does not feel pleasant in seeing and it's also a burden on the government the fact that teresa rivera included this in her um in her plan that's something that was a great impact and another great impact i would say is well um, guaranteeing this with economic growth i think she has managed to not affect economic growth as much as she anticipated it would have affected because um you know, there's issue of uh, nuclear energy. That's what I was trying to remember. It's one of the negative aspects of the impact assessment that nuclear energy is something that is seen positively by the Partido Popular, the PP, whereas her party is seeing nuclear energy from a different scale. So her involvement with the stakeholders and private actors to overcome this difference, that's something that's not happening. So I think that that's hindering this policy implementation. But I think that rest of the plan is in line with what the global fight against climate change is, uh, making jobs very important for my uh, impact analysis, as well as it's in line with what the EU expects that is how to do. So overall, it's a good impact, I would say. Fairly positive. All right, great to hear. Um, I found it very interesting as well when reading your report that and you even mentioned this before, that Teresa has placed an emphasis on the Spanish production of hydrogen, um, especially because we actually have a whole episode in this podcast dedicated to the Trudeau and Schultz agreement regarding their hydrogen alliance and what this means for the entire hydrogen supply in Europe. So I wanted to ask you, uh, why does Teresa consider hydrogen production such an effective policy um, in combating climate change? And where also would it place Spain in this wider context of European hydrogen production? Ah, it's a very, very uh, interesting example that you have mentioned, Trudeau and Schultz. I remember reading about it. And hydrogen was actually one of the first areas that I wrote about in my research. It was one of the most well uh, put areas of Teresa Rivera's policies. I would say that, you know, um, renewable hydrogen in the eyes of our government is is uh, one of the priorities to the solution to achieve you know climate neutrality and to develop a good you know what do we say that industrial value in the european union and they also talk about renewable hydrogen as um, I, i'm going a bit into technicalities but to talk about an energy vector in its uh, where it is seen as one of the good solutions for process of decarbonization such as hydrogen intensive industry is an example and high temperature processes there's also long distance transport mentioned in there there's which includes maritime you know there's rail and aviation i also talked about that previously you see how her policies are tying into all the issues and alleg and it gives it a great potential as an instrument for energy storage. Energy storage is something that is very, very important for, you know, uh, for sustaining a steady energy supply uh, in countries around the world. And uh, so Teresa is looking at uh, green hydrogen, renewable hydrogen. It's something that it's, it's, it's very good as a framework. And I think that she should prioritize her stages of deployment of that. There's you know, projects linked to hydrogen production, you know, and there's mobility projects. There's, for example, there's hydrogen valleys, which is going to play a big role in the future. There's, um, you know, there's industry that uses hydrogen, but as raw materials. There's oil refining, you know, fertilizers, uh, and there is also those chemicals that have great potential to boost renewable hydrogen production. So we are literally replacing something that's looked upon as from very suspicious eyes to something that can actually benefit the Spanish economy. So, but the negative side always, uh, to be unbiased, it's too ambitious. 
and targets at there are targets at EU level for um, this is a different playing field on which they operate. So I think that that should be mature by Teresa, and I think that she should looking at the long term, not just making plans in the short term. And apart from that, when the government approved hydrogen roadmap, you know they actually are planning to um, achieve a goal, which is uh, a climate neutrality by 2050, which is at the latest. So that's that's very, very ambitious. I'm talking about uh, bureaucratic blocks, yes, but I'm sure they'll be able to handle it on a policy-making level. Yeah, so I just wanted to get into exactly this last aspect as my final question uh, regarding her policies. Um, what exactly political or bureaucratic blocks that you keep mentioning does Teresa face when she tries to reach these objectives, for example, of you know, increasing the Spanish share of renewables so that they reach the level that the EU requires or that the EU wants? So yeah, if you could just get very quickly into these blocks, um, it would really help our listeners comprehend uh, what Teresa you know, has to face on a daily basis. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll get. I'll surely talk about the block. It's it's uh, it's a very, it's something that's some similar to what's happening in uh, many countries around Southeast Asia. Also, I mean, I'm not uh, drawing any comparisons, but you know, bureaucratic blocks on a regional level versus the national level is something that's very, very um, detrimental, if that's the word, for you know, certain actions that are supposed to be taken. You know, I will be talking about, you know, those autonomous communities in Spain. This is again Spanish politics 101. Um, the autonomous communities in Spain, many of them don't even have the word climate emergency in them. Like, it's something that they don't even recognize. And it's not a conservative versus liberal issue at all. But it's something that just they are not aware about. Or if they are aware about, they look at something that's um, not beneficial for their economy. So uh, we can we can at worst sympathize with what they are doing, but in the end, there is no climate action, right? So where do we draw the line between satisfying these stakeholders and um, you know um, and fulfilling the climate action goals? Another diplomatic block that I'm going to mention. I remember political opposition within our own party, Teresa Ribera's party. That's something that I would be addressing. But before that, I would mention one last thing about autonomous communities is that it's divided into 17 of these communities. And each of them have a regional government with varying levels of legislative, administrative powers, etc., etc. But, you know, they have control over areas such as education, healthcare, culture, the main very important part. So, you know, these regional communities fight among each other also, not in a very bad or detrimental way, but in a way that the policies that one is applying, the other one villainizes. So the only few communities, there are only three communities to be specific that had laws focusing on climate change before the national level jurisdictions were introduced which were Catalonia, Andalusia, and Balearic Islands. And only one, uh, like, oh, sorry, oh, they have, in, uh, not one, but now I think it's more than that, had incorporated the term climate change into their ministries. Back in the day, it was only a handful, but now it's more because uh, it's the, the data changes. So unless pressured by the central government, which Teresa Ribera is trying to do, and I'm pretty sure... Whoever comes to power, they'll try to do this. But if too much pressure is applied on these autonomous communities, old wounds start coming about. And that goes into proper, proper politics. So that's a very, very big block. And very, very last point I'll mention quickly to not take up much of the time is that uh, I was talking about opposition within Teresa Ribera's own party, right? There were allegations against her government or or against her ministry to be in, being in a, inefficient basically and there were certain people who were trying to you know absorb her ministry and were trying to get uh, the control of her industry 
coinciding with other uh, economic sectors of the government. But Pedro Sanchez, he defended Teresa Rivera till the last end, and he uh, made sure that you know uh, the conflict was solved. At one point, even Teresa Rivera's own husband was alleging against her. So her own husband getting involved in this shows that bureaucratic blocks were at the deepest at that time. So yes, that's what I think is the challenges that Teresa is facing. Thank you, Ajinka. Truly a very rich analysis into Teresa Rivera. But in conclusion to our discussion today, because unfortunately we have to start to wrap up, would you say, based on your extensive research, that yes or no, Teresa Rivera is a climate leader? Okay, uh, we had this question faced many times, and I'm going to keep my answer very short here, very concise, because I think that it's, it is a straightforward answer. I think Teresa Rivera is, yes, a climate leader, a very um, determined climate leader indeed. And personally speaking, uh, this is something that I, I won't um, emphasize on, but even though I don't match ideologically, I'm not on the same wavelength as Teresa Rivera's political ideas, but I can't help but admire the efforts that went into it. If only the center and the um, other end of the political spectrum, the conservative right, incorporated uh, Teresa Rivera's policies in case if they come to power, it's going to help Spain very, very much. Teresa Rivera has not just uh, introduced her own image, but she has also created like an informal machine, which it's going to keep running, provided it's not disturbed by any of the other parties. So I think uh, given enough determination, given enough cooperation, and given the lack of political blocks from both ends, both from the uh, the center-left side and the center-right side, I think it's going to work very well. And Teresa Rivera is indeed a good climate leader that played a big role in this. So yes, that's So thank you, Ajinka. Uh, Again, you, we can tell from what you've told us that you genuinely found out a lot about T Teresa Rivera and she genuinely also cares about the climate. But... Before moving on to our last segment, I just wanted to know very quickly what you believe are the three top takeaways that our listeners should have when they do their own uh, process of research and analysis. So what have you learned in your own process and how far do you think you've come in analyzing individuals and the way they make their decisions? Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to give some takeaways both what I had myself and for the audience, lovely audience, I'm going to say that the first takeaway that I've um, always felt that uh, was very important was that you don't just analyze policies by what certain sources tell you. It's a very basic thing, but you also go out of the way and look at the independent impacts that this policy has had which may or may not have been exclusively mentioned in certain documents. Like I was looking at her time in 2008 to 11, and then the, the four years in between 2014, uh, that time period. And I was very um, confused initially of what, how will I draw the impact? But then what did I do is that I looked at the data of, how did Spanish economy, how did the Spanish political sector react in this time period, in the climate action sector? And I got to know what they are, uh, what the policy response has been. And also, I have spent nights and nights just <laughs> looking at uh, the the very news of the of the relevance regarding this. Like I have been always looking at political news about uh, Teresa Rivera and delved in depth into Spanish politics, like more than anyone could imagine. And then I went into opposition parties, their views, lots of data. At one point there was an information overload. Every writer will face that. Like uh, this is something for the audience that I would say, 
any uh, writer faces that there is either too much information or too less information. But they have to maneuver their way out of it. That's a very big key takeaway. And the last takeaway is that impartiality. You know, we humans are not immune to bias. We ourselves are biased or the person in front of us is also biased or both, you know. So I think that when you look at both the positive and negative aspects of transcending your uh, political ideas, I think that that gives excellent analysis. Uh, I admit that we, when we were working in a group, these issues did come about, but we dealt with them very, very, very um, maturely. So I think that that's something very important. Three takeaways I mentioned for the audience. Perfect. So now we move on to a new segment uh, that we like to call Two Sides, One Mic. And for five minutes, you know, I'll read out some opposing statements that have been made about the leader or about the topic of, at hand. And you will be able to discuss about, about how these statements connect to the research that you have done on your climate leader. Because our goal in this segment is to look at what is currently being said by other individuals about the climate leader and their policies and have our guests, so in this case yourself, debate or comment on it using what they've really found in their analysis. So in this case, uh, you know, you've mentioned this multiple times, but party politics and the Spanish conservative rights, particularly the Partido Popular, have clashed with Teresa Rivera. And the PP actually presented a July 2023 program before the Spanish general elections. And their program really focused on, and I quote directly from it, strengthening and protecting the agri-food system and devoting a lot of measures to recover industrial activity without necessarily much information on how to move towards, uh, you know, industrial activity as well as carbon neutrality, if that's even possible. On the other side of the mic, however, you know, Teresa has shown equal concern over such criticism from the PP, and she's also maintained a very firm stance that Spain must, so its industries and politicians, must embrace the effects of climate change. And she criticized this particular plan of the PP because of its lack of adequate measures. I think one of her most interesting statements is one where she said, It is worrying to listen to representatives who say that climate change is a tall tale or that it does not exist because this denialism and this lateness in thinking is the last thing the Spanish economy can afford. Nevertheless, when she was asked uh, when the Spanish government, you know, would revise uh, these targets regarding reducing emissions, uh, restarting the economy, she answered before the elections, the general elections. So... My question is the following. Given this timeline, uh, what would the aftermath of the recent 2023 Spanish general elections mean for Teresa? You know, we have uh, certain results that I think might either, uh, you know, help her take a step forward or a st step backwards. Um, so what really might we expect to see from the climate leader and her policies after these general elections? Um, take it away. Okay, okay. Yes, uh, multiple points for this. I would say that um, the denialism that uh, the climate action in the sector is dealing like a cartel, like a, like a very closed circle, biased circle of sorts, that denialism is coming somewhere from the nature of climate action that's being seen all across the European Union. Like, there is a certain amount of policymakers. There is a sophisticated system where uh, their policies are made, politicians lay their groundwork and everything. And on the other hand, there are also climate lobbyists. And this whole phenomenon was also voiced by so many conservatives all across the world, you know, even in the United States and Europe, especially in Spain. So I would say that with regards to Teresa Ribera, after the general elections, I think we can see some policies that are forwards for the 
in simple words, the industries that comply. Like, I'm not being biased here, but uh, eventually speaking, Teresa Rivera's actions are absolute of, is, are of absolute nature. You comply because that's the only way they can afford it. The Spanish economy can sustain only if they are taking collective action because the actions themselves are very radical in some sections. So, yeah, that's something that we would see. But we can also see a backward for the farmer and the agri-food sector, like you mentioned. Like, agri-food sector is something that's going to be um, really impacted by this quarrel. And there's one more political party from the right that is claiming to be the so-called savior of this sector is that the walks. Yeah. And uh, they, are, they are also doing the complete opposite of what Teresa Ribera wants to do. So I think uh, with regards to emission reduction targets and everything, Teresa Ribera will go ahead with her plan. And if not, it will just be at a standstill. And, so, and all the policies that are in place, like I mentioned, the machine, the machine will keep running at its own pace. It's going to run, but with some other minor changes and stuff. Yes. All right. So thank you, Ajinka. As this episode comes to an end, I just wanted to touch upon some key points. You know, so we have Teresa Rivera as Spain's Minister for the Ecological Transition and the Demographic Challenge since 2018. But she also served as the Spanish Secretary for, of State for Climate Change beforehand. And all this gave her trivial experience in the climate action field. We looked with Ajinka at her contributions at the EU policy level regarding the, particularly the negotiations of the Paris Agreement during her time at the IDDRI and how she brought back these relevant learnings to the Spanish national policy field. And then we also looked at Teresa Rivera's policies, such as her targets regarding renewables and carbon neutrality or her hydrogen roadmap and the impact of each of these policies, as well as, again, the current challenges she faces, uh, as we just, as Ujinka just mentioned, with different political parties, within her own political party, and with always keeping in mind the concerns of the Spanish population, the economic concerns, the political concerns. So it's been really such a pleasure to have Ajinka on Raya Affairs today. He really went into depth, as everyone can tell, on into Teresa Rivera and her climate policies. So thank you very much, Ajinka, for your dedication in this episode. It's been truly a great example of all your hard work. Yeah, thank you so much, actually, to you uh, and the team for hosting this podcast and for inviting me, for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, voice the analysis uh, that we have been doing since the last two months. And I also really, really enjoyed the discussion. To be very honest, I had wished it would have been longer, <laughs> but uh, maybe the audience could read our research later. And I think that um, Teresa Rivera is someone very, very important behind the shadows, just rising into relevance. And I, I was, I'm glad that I've had the pleasure to analyze such a profile. And in the future, I look forward to uh, analyze more such profiles and preferably on the other side of the political spectrum. <laughs> and I, so that we have a more diversity of research and last thing I would just, on my thank you note that I would be willing to emphasize is that keep doing the great work that you guys are doing. And one special note for our audience is that being an analyst and being a politician are two different things. Uh, you can't intersect the both uh, at a complete level. So if you want to be an analyst, you try to be as non-biased as possible. And you look at always the other side without making any early on judgments. And when if you want to be a politician, it's about being dedicated to your ideology. And it's about uh, running things, not just reading about them and writing about them. So thank you so much to you. Uh, you've been an excellent host, Marina. And thanks for Raya for this amazing podcast. Thank you. Um, great words at the very end. And again... 
I just want to emphasize the report is super thorough. If those of you please are interested and have enjoyed our discussion and want to read the report on Teresa Rivera, click the link in the episode description or find Ajinka and his partner Valeria's research on rayagroup.org. Also, make sure to follow us on Instagram, raya.now, for all the latest on our Climate Leader program. It was such a pleasure hosting this discussion today. Goodbye, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. Have a great day in your sphere of influence. Thank you.